In the introductory video, I've mentioned several times that Ethereum is built on the account-based model and that this is different to Bitcoin's UTXO model. But so far, we haven't really talked about what exactly the account-based model is, what an account is for that matter. So in this video, we will look into that and we will also set up our first accounts on a testnet, uh, fill it with some test for so that we are ready for the development process later on. All right, so to get started, when people talk about the differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum, they usually just refer to smart contracts as the number one difference. And of course, that's true. With Bitcoin, you are somewhat limited in, in terms of what you can do. And with Ethereum, you have much more flexibility in terms of the smart contract setup. But let's actually take a step back and see why this is the case and look at the differences on a more foundational level. And um, to actually look at that, we have to talk about something that's called the UTXO model on the Bitcoin side and the account-based model on the Ethereum side. Now, what's important to understand, this is not exclusive to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Most blockchains are built on either this system or this system. So here where we really track the individual assets and uh, here where you have uh, various kinds of accounts and then you look at um, basically uh, where the where the assets are on in terms of the accounts, so uh, to whom they belong, to which account they belong. So let's let's actually quickly recap for those of you who have not taken the Bitcoin blockchain and crypto assets course and uh, revisit Bitcoin really quick. With Bitcoin, what you're doing is uh, when you're spending a Bitcoin, uh, then you're essentially creating one of these UTXOs or unspent transaction outputs. And uh, these unspent transaction outputs, they represent a uh, Bitcoin, a number of Bitcoins or a fraction of Bitcoins. So it's really this denomination in the native protocol asset, um, so in Bitcoin. And they have a, a condition, a spending condition, basically. And these conditions, they are on each of these UTXOs. So the UTXO, the unspent transaction output, is confirmed on the blockchain. It is there. Everyone can see it. Uh, everyone could spend it provided they can solve this challenge. Uh, they can come up with a solution to this condition, this spending condition. So in the case of the UTXO model, you have the conditions that are on each UTXO. So the conditions, the spending conditions, the conditions under which this asset can be spent are on the asset. And they determine how the UTXO, so how the asset can be spent. Now, many cases people talk about accounts in the context of Bitcoin, but that's just completely wrong. I mean, it's it's great. It's a thought experiment and um, it's great to think about Bitcoin in that way. But in Bitcoin, there are no accounts. It's really just these UTXOs. And for example, when you have an address, a Bitcoin address that um, kind of looks like an account, in reality, it's just a spending condition which says that um, you have to sign a transaction uh, with a private key uh, that corresponds to a public key which hashes to this Bitcoin address. And then you can, with these scripting conditions, verify whether that is the case. So no accounts in the, in the, in the case of Bitcoin. It's really just these UTXOs and the spending conditions. With Ethereum, it's different. With Ethereum, you have the account-based model. And with the account-based model, as the name suggests, you have actual accounts. So it's not the individual assets which are tracked. It's not the individual assets that are have uh, payment conditions on them, but it's rather the accounts and um, the assets can be on these accounts. So, for example, I can I can have an account, an externally owned account. That's one type of accounts, as we will see later on. And any asset that uh, is on that account, any asset I have the uh, permission to spend with that account um, can be spent with a simple signature from the private key that corresponds to the account. Okay, so it's really this account based system, this account based logic. Similarly, when you have a contract account, and you will see that also later on, which is essentially a smart contract, and then you have some rules on the account, and any assets that are on this account. Um, any assets that are, that are controlled by this account have to adhere to these rules so they can only be released when these rules, when these conditions of the account are met. So you see, it's, it seems like a subtle difference, but it has a, a lot of implications. It's actually a completely different system. So on the left here uh, with Bitcoin, 
uh, you have the conditions on the asset and here uh, on the account based model you have the conditions on the account and that's completely different and as a first key takeaway um, we could say the ability to implement logic on an account um, based level is more flexible more intuitive and easier to handle than conditions on the UTXO uh, level um, for the simple reason that people are used to work with accounts and it's somewhat strange when you have to handle each of these assets individually and whenever you send an asset to someone you have to come up with this new spending conditions it's also a super powerful concept so i'm not saying the utxo model is bad in any way but it's just the account-based model is more intuitive uh, in that respect and in many cases much easier to work with at least on a high level so with Ethereum, as I said, instead of the UTXO model, it uses the account-based model and accounts essentially are 20 byte addresses. They are based on the public key and um, it's a hexadecimal encoding. So it's a base 16 encoding for the non-computer um, scientist majors in, in this class. Don't get confused. It's super easy. It's just instead of your usual notation where you have base 10, so 0 until 9, uh, 0 to 9. Uh, here you have base 16, so it's 0 to 9 and A to F to represent the number. Essentially, what you're, what you're, excuse me, what you're seeing here, uh, right here, is just a, a really large number, and you could equally uh, represent that in a, a base 10 notation it would just be a little longer because you need obviously more digits when you're representing something where at each position you only have 10 possibilities instead of 16, 16 possibilities at each position so this is an example right here uh, again 0x is just to say hey this is the, the address this is hexadecimal where it starts and then you have d3 ee and so on that is the actual address so the, the, the 20 byte address as of right now. And there is one, well, a certain drawback with these uh, addresses. And um, again, for those of you who have already taken the Bitcoin class or have some experience with Bitcoin, yeah, you remember the checksums. When we had these, these Bitcoin addresses for the payment conditions, there were some checksums with the idea that mm, when you have a typo in there, you can actually identify uh, that the address is invalid that there well, was some probability that there is a typo in there and obviously when you have just this uh, hexadecimal address 20 byte address where um, everything would be possible uh, theoretically speaking then it's really hard to identify these typos in fact you cannot identify these typos and there also is no uh, native checksum in there so there has been a, a, an eip an ethereum improvement proposal that is actually in effect with many wallets and uh, it uses hash functions to come up with a very clever way to implement a checksum. A checksum that actually um, is checked through the capitalization, so uppercase and lowercase letters in the address. And the way this works is it uses the ketchup hash function. Um, it uses just the hash value of the entire address right here. Then you end up with the then you end up with the hash value of that address, and uh, essentially what you're doing is, and I can show you that much easier when I uh, show you the graph right here. So this is the catch-up. This is the the unchanged address right here. This is basically your input up here, and then you're ending up with the hash value, and you take the first uh, few positions of this hash value, and then you compare it one by one. Okay, and essentially what you're doing is whenever there is a letter in the original address so for example here position one you have a d d certainly is a letter in a position three and four you have e's at five you have c all of these are letters again then there is a letter at a position and basically you're looking um if the um, if the hash value at the same position is any alphanumeric character above seven or seven and lower. If it is seven and lower, then what you're doing is, um, as, in, as in this case right here, you're using a, a lowercase letter here. So the two, in this case, because two is lower uh, or equal seven, you take the E and have a lowercase E in the final address. Same here with five. 
five is lower equal seven so it's uh, you get a lowercase e four is lower equal seven so you get a lowercase c and so on but here for example with the d at position one in the hash value you end up with an e and if you're ending up with an e in the hash value and e certainly in hexadecimal is larger than seven this is the signal that d must be capitalized and the idea is really that you can check the address through these lowercase and uppercase letters um, that when there is a typo um, somewhere in here when you're using these lowercase uppercase encoding then you will end up with a completely different hash value obviously have you seen that's something you have seen in the in the hash function video and when you have an address and then a completely different hash value this will lead to a completely different capitalization. That's the idea. I'm showing you this, that when you're seeing these capitalized letter addresses, uh, that you're realizing what it actually is. And also that when you're developing your applications later on, that you know how to uh, work with, the, with these different addresses. But essentially what you're looking at right here, no matter whether you have uh, just everything in uppercase, or you have a checksum included with some variation in uppercase and lowercase. These are the addresses, these are the accounts in the Ethereum system. That's essentially the pseudonym that represents you in the Ethereum system. So there are, as I mentioned, two different kinds of accounts. On the one hand, you have the externally owned accounts and externally owned accounts are always controlled by a private key. And therefore, usually uh, by just a single person, who is in possession of the private key. And the idea is quite similar to what you're used to with Bitcoin. Essentially what you're doing is you're signing a transaction with your private key and you're signing a transaction with your private key and the address itself is a representation of your public key then people can verify whether this actually originates with you and that's the idea. So you have the address, you have a balance in Ether and then you have the nonce and the nonce is just uh, how many transactions have been sent with that account before. So the idea is that you're uh, basically you just iterate up. So you have zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then every every subsequent transaction is just plus one. And so uh, this is just a representation of how many transactions you have already sent with that account. And contract accounts are a little different with contract accounts. Um, they are not governed by a private key. Instead, they are governed by the rules on that contract account. And contract account in that regard is just a different name for smart contract. With a contract account, when you deploy it, uh, you send some um, code alongside the deployment transaction, it gets created, and then the contract account responds to incoming transactions in whatever way it has been specified. Okay, so it's not controlled by a private key, of course, you could specify that in the code. So you could also have a contract account. You could say that somebody has special privileges and um, for example, add a specific uh, externally owned account that actually owns this contract account. But by default, it's really just this account that is not controlled by a private key, but instead just listens to the code that is deployed on there. And this is really the foundation for smart contracts. And what you have on there is Again, it has an address, it has a balance. So these contract accounts, these smart contracts can also hold E for themselves. They also have a nonce, although nonce in this context is something different. Uh, contract accounts, as you will see later on, cannot initiate transactions. They can forward transactions, so-called internal transactions, but they can never initiate action out of nothing. They, they can only react when they, re when they are receiving a transaction, they can do something with it but they cannot initiate the transaction themselves. So obviously the nonce in this case is not the number of transactions that has been initiated by this account. Instead is how many uh, other contract accounts have been created by this contract account. Because that's also something we will look into later on. Contract accounts can themselves create new contract accounts, so basically child accounts. And then you have the contract code, of course, on there. These are the rules. Uh, the rules by which these contract accounts, this specific contract account is governed, and of course contract storage. So the idea that when you have some variables, some state variables in this contract account, something you want to store on there, uh, then this contract account has its specific storage uh, for these values. 
So again, key takeaway, externally owned accounts are controlled by a private key, contract accounts are controlled by the contract code. Um, again, as I've mentioned earlier, since you're completely flexible of the contract code, you could put potentially write something in there that allows you to control a contract account with a private key, but by default, it will always listen to the code. And by default, there is no um, native um, private key that gives you control over a contract account. It's really just the code and whatever is written in there. So how are these contract accounts created? Uh, we have already briefly looked at that last time in the public blockchain primer. Uh, where we said that Edith, uh, Edith, as an example, would send a deployment transaction to the network um, where she specifies the contract code, so basically instructions, basically the script, and this gets um, relayed with the network until it is confirmed, and that's the way a new smart contract, which is just a synonym for contract account, is created. But let us look at a little lower level, just a little bit, and understand some of the terminology um, that is used in this context. So um, there are a few steps. Number one, everything usually starts with an EOA. Uh, the EOA issues a transaction and this transaction has the recipient address uh, zero X O and so on. So it's really the zero address it is targeted uh, towards and that's the signal essentially that this externally owned account wants to deploy a new contract account. Similarly, a contract account can also deploy a new contract account. That's something I've said earlier already, um, but this can only be done through an internal transaction, so basically forwarding. That's something we will deal with in the transaction slide deck. But again, what's important to understand is um, any account can create a contract account. The difference is that EOAs can initiate it actively and CAs, contract accounts, can only respond to incoming transactions and then create um, basically a new contract account a in reaction to uh, an incoming transaction they have received. The transaction itself, the deployment transaction, carries the contract code. So it carries the instructions that are used to deploy this contract account. It carries the scripts that will be deployed alongside the contract account that basically make up the rules of the smart contract later on. And once a transaction is confirmed, you can look at the smart contract or the contract account as being deployed. So when there is the confirmation, um, the contract account will be on the blockchain and can be interacted with. The new contract account address, um, obviously it cannot be a public key as with the with the externally owned accounts since it is not controlled by private key, so there is no corresponding public key. So there must be some other form of an address and it should be unique, not theoretically unique. Um, that's simply not possible uh, in a closed set, but it should be, there shouldn't be any collisions, right? So it should be, should not be feasible to find collisions with addresses. So for all practical purposes, it should be unique. And the way this is done is, uh, again, with hash functions, so with SHA-3-256, you have an input, uh, you use the address of the sender and the nonce of the uh, sender account. Recall that the nonce is just the number of transactions that have been sent from an externally owned account. Well, to be more precise, it's, it starts with zero, so the first transaction you're, you're, you're sending from an externally owned account has non zero, the, the next one has non one, and so on. So if you're looking for the exact number of transactions that have been sent from an account, you have actually have to add one uh, to the current nonce, but that's a detail. Um, and with contract accounts, it's how many contracts, uh, how many contract accounts have been deployed from any given contract account. So when you have a contract account and this contract account uh, is deploying his first contract account, then this will be again non-zero, next one non one and so on. And what you're doing is you're taking this address as of the sender, so either of the externally owned account of the contract account and the nonce, um, and put it in the hash function, and then you end up with some hash value and of course there is some encoding going on. I'm not talking about that right here, but intuitively that's essentially what is part of the address. That is how the address of a contract account is being selected. 
Now, the account-based model is more intuitive. We already said that it's also more flexible in many ways, but of course, it also has some disadvantages. It also has some drawbacks compared to the UTXO model. And one particular drawback is privacy concerns. I mean, with the UTXO model, what's really nice about it is that um, essentially, since you are not really using accounts, it's just using them as a um, um, temporary representation in the payment condition. Um, when we talk about Bitcoin addresses, for example, yeah, you will use um, at least most wallet softwares will use a new uh, Bitcoin address with every single transaction. So they are basically just using them for one transaction, for one incoming transaction, and then they uh, trash these addresses, uh, trash these Bitcoin addresses and uh, use a different one. And that's much stronger in terms of privacy because um, when you have a, essentially a Bitcoin address for each UTXO, uh, it's much harder to um, uh, correlate these different UTXOs to a, to a single pseudonym to a single person. Whereas with an account-based model, where people in many cases use the same account over and over and over again, and uh, with some of these transactions, you may leak some some identity revealing information or in, in the uh, community terms terminology that would be doxing yourself. Um, basically, you're leaking information about your identity. Uh, then, of course, anything else that goes through that account can also um, be uh, looked at as coming from the same identity. So it has much weaker uh, privacy um, properties and that's something that uh, of course is a concern with the account-based model. Number two, it's not necessarily a problem but it's something you have to be aware uh, of. Um, the nonce is used because with Ethereum you're not referring to a specific output um, and in many cases that would be a, that would be an issue. I mean, for to give you a really simple example, with Bitcoin you cannot have double spends uh, because you're always referring to the same unspent. You're always referring to one specific unspent transaction output. And, uh, this this one unspent transaction output can be used once and then it's gone. When you have an account based model, there could be situations where, for example, you have let's say uh, one ether on your account, and then you're issuing a transaction where you're saying, okay, I'd like to transfer 0.1 Ether, but since you're not specifying um, which monetary unit, which asset exactly, which fraction of Ether exactly will be transferred, so you're not specifying the specific unit of Ether that is transferred, you're just saying deduct 0.1 Ether from my account, um, the same transaction could be used multiple times if, if there aren't any additional restrictions in there, if there weren't any additional restrictions in there, right? So basically somebody could just take the same transaction and after the first instant of the transaction has been confirmed, they could say, oh, nice, okay, I still have this transaction, there's this valid signature, it's not referring to a specific unit, so I'm just going to use it again and I'm transferring yet another 0.1 Ether. And then somebody else could say, okay, I'm transferring yet another 0.1 Ether. And of course, the address and everything is specified in there, but it would allow somebody essentially to use the uh, a specific transaction, to use a, a valid transaction multiple times and uh, just confirm it multiple times. So obviously we need some way of saying this has already been used, especially when you think about situations, for example, where you have um, uh, issued a transaction for these 0.1 Ether and then you realize um, that the transaction fees aren't sufficient, let's say. And uh, you want to add some additional transaction fees to make sure that it gets confirmed faster. And if you wouldn't have any additional uh, things like the nonce we're going to talk about right now, um, what would happen is you couldn't reissue a new transaction because the old one would still be valid, the old one would still exist. So let's say I have a, a 0.1 Ether I want to transfer with a small transaction fee. This one is not transferred because the transaction fee is not sufficient. And then I'm creating the same transaction, otherwise same transaction with a higher transaction fee. That would be a bad idea because eventually transaction fees could come down and then the other person could still use the old transaction, uh, send it to the network and hope that it will get confirmed. 
Now, in order to avoid that, we have this nonce. And the nonce essentially just says whether a transaction is competing or whether it's the idea is that it is a subsequent transaction. When there are multiple transactions with the same address and the same nonce, they are competing. Only one of these transactions can get confirmed. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, for example, when I have an address and I'm issuing two transactions, both of them have non-zero. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's otherwise the same transaction or something completely different. Only one of these two transactions can get confirmed. Now, that's just one part of what you need to know. The other thing is that when you have, let's say, um, created a transaction at the same time with one of um, with, with non-zero, let's say, and then you have a, another transaction with nonce one, then the nonce one transaction can only get confirmed once the nonce zero transaction from your address has been confirmed already. So it really has to be in the subsequent order. It always has to be the next nonce. So it has to build on the last transaction that has been sent from your account. And it will only ever be valid when you're using the next nonce. And this really allows you to, I mean, obviously your wallet is doing that on, on behalf of you uh, for most intents and purposes. But in some cases, uh, you will not get a round of manually adjusting this nonce. And the idea is really that you are in control whether this transaction is conflicting with a previous one that has not yet been confirmed or whether it should be a subsequent one that will build on the next one. But you have to be careful because when you're playing around with the nonce, there are situations um, where your higher nonce transactions will not get confirmed just because a lower nonce transaction uh, is still pending, has not yet been confirmed either. And this also, I mean, this is also nonce related. Now, there can be some unintended conflicts when you're using the same private keys with multiple wallets. So for example, when you're using the same private key on your mobile device and also um, in, in your uh, browser extension like MetaMask, we're gonna look at later on, and you're issuing two different transactions at approximately the same time, um, then they can have the same nonce if the two wallets are not yet in sync, if they haven't realized the current state of the account of the address and the current nonce they should use. And in that case, it can happen that you have two different wallets, you have issued two different transactions. Uh, you want both of them to be valid, uh, but just because these two wallets don't know of the existence of the other one, um, you run in the issue where both of them have the same nonce. Now, again, this is a super edge case. Don't worry about it too much. I, I, it's important that you are aware that these things can happen. But so, that's something that uh, only can happen when you have um, multiple wallets with the same private key in there uh, and only if you're issuing um, transactions at approximately the same time from both of these wallets so it's really an edge case but it's something you have to be aware of and certainly a potential drawback of the account-based system. Now let's get started with some super easy exercises. I mean this is just something we have to set up in order to be ready for the uh, developing part later on. And what we're doing right now is we're setting up a browser plugin, a browser extension, MetaMask. That's basically your wallet, the idea uh, of a Web3 wallet that connects your browser to the blockchain, allows you to issue some transaction, allows you to get some information from the uh, visualizing it in, in, in your browser, some blockchain information. And then we are setting up new accounts and we are funding these accounts with some Robston test ether. Um, there will be more information on test networks, but just for you right now, the idea is that we're not using Ethereum mainnet, uh, because obviously I'm not expecting you to spend uh, a lot of money on ether for this lecture. The idea is that we are using something that is uh, really just uh, completely free for you to try out. It acts exactly as the original ether. Uh, you can try out all of these different things like sending transactions, like deploying smart contracts and so on. But you're not on Ethereum mainnet, you are on a test network. And for this first exercise, we will use Robston testnet. Later on, we will even create our own blockchain where you can test against. So the idea is that you get some test Eve, um, then you back up your so-called monomic phrase. These are just these 12, word, 12 words that are used um, to 
uh, reinitiate your wallet where if you if, if something goes wrong it's basically your backup uh, seed phrase uh, it's not that important for a testnet but of course if we will be talking about actual fonts you don't want to lose that so you have to make sure that your monomic phrase um, is stored somewhere safely not on your computer not in digital form ideally just on a, a paper slip or on something more robust where you can lock it away and where nobody else will be able to find it, but you uh, always have it as a backup solution in case anything go, goes wrong. And then uh, you go to the Robson for set. Uh, the link is on the slides. Uh, you can use uh, also different for sets. Of course, the idea of a set is just uh, some small application where you can get some test ether for the specific test net just to play around. Now, what's super important is if you are currently managing mainnet funds, so if you have already some EFER, do not use the same instance of the MetaMask plugin. Ideally, use a different browser or use a new profile. Um, when you have a new profile in most browsers, this will initiate also a new instance of the browser extensions, but do not use the same addresses you're using on mainnet for these testnet purposes. That would be a really bad idea, first of all, for privacy reasons. Second, also, there can be some uh, cryptographic issues that could arise when you're doing that. Uh, it's just an additional risk you don't want to take. So set it up completely separately in case uh, you have already some mainnet ether. Uh, and make sure that this is really just your test setup. So new browser, new plugin, uh, just specifically for this class. In exercise two, uh, we're going to create a second account uh, with MetaMask, and we're gonna transfer 0.1 Robston Ether, so our ETH, from your first account to your second account. Uh, you will check the transaction on a so-called Block Explorer. Block Explorer essentially is just a, a way that nicely visualizes uh, the information from the blockchain um, so it's it's essentially a website a web service where you can look whether your transactions have been confirmed already and you have some nice visualization some nice added information um, without really having to uh, go through the entire blockchain without having to have your own full node on your computer now it's still a good idea to run, run your own full node uh, because essentially when you're relying on these websites you're really trusting these websites uh, again, when we're talking about a testnet, it's not that important and, it's, and it has many benefits and pretty much everyone works with these block explorers, even if they have their own full nodes. But I, I want just to mention that I, I, uh, I didn't say you should not run your own full nodes. I still think it's super important to do that. And I think if you're really interested in the topic and you want to play around, that's something you should consider. But uh, also these block explorers like Etherscan are super powerful tools and, and something you should still uh, use in the development process. And then last but not least, transfer the balance from your second account back to your first account. So then you're basically switching identities. You're switching the account uh, in your MetaMask wallet and just sending the funds back. And that's it. That's really it for the setup. Then you have your first wallet, you have your first test for you know how to issue these transactions, and that's something we can build on. All right, so I'm gonna actually step away so you can see the screen, and the first thing we do is we go to metamaster.io. And then you click on download now, you go to install MetaMask for Chrome or whatever browser you're using and add to Chrome or to the browser of your choice. This is essentially your wallet, your Web3 wallet, as you will see later on for the transactions. What you can do here is you can fix it in your taskbar, then you will actually see it with the nice Fox icon. You click on first steps, you click on create new wallet on the right side. Again, if you already have one, you're still doing that. Uh, you read all of these important information and uh, if you agree, you click on agree. And then you have to come up with a password. Now, under normal circumstances, that's super important. If it's just your test, uh, e for a test account, you can pretty much pick anything you can remember. But again, uh, in reality, choose a secure password, a long one, a random one with uh, alphanumeric and special characters. 
Then you have your monomic seep phrase right here. I'm not going to show you that. It's these 12 words. Uh, you have to write them down. Don't store them on like, your computer. Store them on a paper slip. And you need them uh, later on. Actually, next step. And right here. And again, this is your monomic phrase uh, on the lower end. You just click on the words in the right order. And then once you've done that, you can confirm. So here we are in the wallet. You can see right now we have zero ETH. And we have one account by default. And what we're doing up here is we're switching from Ethereum mainnet to Robsten test network. So it's as easy as that. You're connecting your different blockchain to a test blockchain. And then you're going to faucet.robsten.be. And here you can copy your uh, address from MetaMask by clicking on account one right here. Then you're copying uh, your address and you can paste it in this little field right here and say, send me some test ETH. You will be added to the queue. Um, you can actually look, you can check for the transaction if you're going to your wallet, MetaMask, to the three dots, and then you do uh, Ether scan the button, and here you already see a pending incoming transaction. That's the facet sending you some ETH. It has not been yet confirmed, it's still pending. Uh, let's click on it, and here we go. We have a success, it is confirmed. We have one block confirmation, and you have 0.3 ETH on your account right here. You can also see it right here, 0.3 ETH on the first account. So what we're doing right now is, uh, we're actually creating a second account. So let me click on the Fox icon again, and then you have create new account right here. We call it account two, create it, and of course it has zero ETH. We're gonna copy that address of the second account, switch back to the first account, and then we click on the send button. We paste the address of the second account, choose to transfer 0.1 ETH right here, and we're gonna con uh, initiate a transaction right here. So this confirmation right here does not mean confirming the blockchain, that's just you confirming the intent to transact, so basically you're signing the transaction. We go to Etherscan once again, and Etherscan recall, that's just the block explorer that shows the status. Uh, it's still pending, so it has not yet been confirmed on the blockchain, it's just a pending transaction. And you see it's from account one to account two, and here we go, we have the success. This should be reflected also right here, account one has 0.2 ETH, and account two has 0.1 ETH. So let us actually send it back to account one. So I have copied account one, go back to account two. On account two, I say send, paste the address of account one. I pick max. So this is just the 0.1 minus the transaction fee that will be deducted and I send it. And uh, now we can check again on Ether scan, wait for the confirmation. Uh, let me actually do that really quick. It actually takes a while. Still waiting. Waiting. Ah, here we go. Perfect. We have a confirmation and we have transferred it back. So the E for R again on account one. All right, so that's it. We have created our first accounts and with that we are ready to proceed with more advanced stuff. Stay curious, see you soon.